Now, there is a controversy to be addressed here. What exactly does John mean by confess? Is it, you know, what's the format of confession? Does he mean like a prayerful confession unto God? Or does he mean verbally confessing before men? Uh, what is the repetition of the confession? Is it just like a one-time confession, like, you know, when John the Baptist baptised and people um, confess their sins? But then, what if it's one time, what happens if we sin after this confession? Is it an ongoing confession? What 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 about the sins of ignorance, the thoughts of foolishness is sin, un, unpresumptuous sins, honest mistakes, struggling against the flesh? Okay, if, it, if it's ongoing, you know, how does that all fit in there? Now... Confession as a word in the Bible, interestingly, isn't actually as common as you might think. It appears just over three dozen times in all its different forms, like past tense, present tense, you know, its different forms. And the underlying Hebrew word, you know, if you look it up in a concordance, can also mean like give thanks or praise in English, because the root word is to, to throw or cast, okay? And, and also, confession doesn't always refer to sin either. It's just like, oh, did you do something? You know, yes, I did it, or, you know bring it to attention that you did something so let's start with a one-time confession could it mean a one-time confession and this is where we'd, we'd normally refer to baptism um because in matthew 3 6 it's explained that the people who were baptized by john confessed their sins right baptism is a one-time event that ought to occur at or shortly after the time of conversion and in Acts 2.38, baptism is explained to be the representation of the, the, the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, okay? So with this context in mind, people would say that confessing sin is an initial confession to admit that one is a sinner, or, you know, if you're a sinless perfectionist, then, you know, repent of your sins for the purpose of believing on the Christ and getting saved, right? Because this is a one-time event, advocates would say that if, if you do some kind of an ongoing confession of sins, you're essentially denying forgiveness because you're not believing that Jesus Christ has already forgiven all of your sins, you know, past, present and future. That's the, the terminology that they'll use, right? But then, you know, we're just asking the questions. That's all we're doing right now. What about ongoing confession or the confession of somebody who is a believer? So, for example, James 5.16 instructs us as brethren to confess your faults. Now, the, the underlying Greek word is the same for sins. To one another. So that, that's a man-to-man -man confession for the purpose that you may be healed of that given sin. Uh, in Acts chapter 8.22, Peter tells Simon the sorcerer to repent of a specific wickedness that the thought of his heart could be forgiven and that that's a very specific issue but but this was not in a salvation context because simon already believed and was baptized before this in verse 13 now in psalm 32 5 david declared um i will confess my transgression unto the lord so that's man to god now um a lot of brethren have a problem with this concept because it, it sounds like jesus hasn't really forgiven us our sins if we have to carry on confessing them but really if you read the psalm though and, and just be honest about the language that david uses he already starts this psalm saying blessed is he whose transgression is you know present tense already forgiven and unto whom the lord uh, does not impute sin and then in verse 5 he says i have acknowledged my sin unto thee so that's like you know it's already happened and, and that's quite an important interpretation i think that will probably give you a picture of what we're talking about he also says you forgave my iniquity past tense so that that's a past tense verse right there but he's still confessing his sins or he's still saying i will confess my sins in the future right uh, you know future tense so according to psalm 32 it's not un unheard of or unbiblical to confess sins to god even though he already forgave you because that's what david did and your transgressions are forgiven right now, uh, but then we, we do raise another problem with this. If it does mean ongoing confession, and perhaps, you know, you might think that this is verbal confession, many people will object to this because of the following problems it presents with you. First of all, you cannot conceivably remember every single sin you have ever done. There's the first problem, right? Secondly, the Bible says we have secret sins, like Psalm 98. Sorry, Psalm 90, verse 8. Uh, we may have sinned in ignorance, not realising that something is a sin, Leviticus 4 talks about that uh, and, there, and under this point you can see that there is a distinction between sins of ignorance and willful presumptuous sins like in, in numbers um, and because of this some sinless perfectionists might say that they'll just say that you have to turn from all known sin so they'll, they'll make like some kind of an exception to unknown sins 
Um, think how Chafee has said something like that. Um, some sins are open to interpretation about whether they really are sins. So, you know, drinking wine, if, if you're sober and you don't actually get drunk, that's obviously something where Christians will disagree with that. Or something like smoking, where the Bible obviously doesn't mention the, the practice. Um, even the thought of foolishness is sin, right? And, you know, Proverbs 24, 9, and we all go through hundreds, if not thousands of foolish thoughts you know we go we all go thousands of thoughts every day so you know you'd think at least a handful of them are foolish so then it, it does present us with this problem because what happens if we don't confess these sins right well uh now let's consider the language of verse nine then. so it, it doesn't strictly say whether we confess our sins before men or before god it, it doesn't give us that context right confession is in the present tense which you, you might say if, if we were just to be unbiased about it you would say that it perhaps makes a stronger case for an ongoing confession rather than a one-off instance just because of how he uses that tense there but also as well remember that the word confess can actually itself have multiple meanings or applications so obviously it can mean to verbally disclose guilt even if somebody didn't actually ask you to confess but then on the other hand, you could just admit it if you were questioned about it, you know, even if it's not a moral issue. Did you do this? Well, yes, either you did or either you confess you did or you deny, right? And and so this is important, is, is that it can mean just to acknowledge or admit a particular belief. And actually very similar to the word profess, but with more honesty and sincerity. So obviously you could profess that Jesus is Lord, or you could confess that Jesus is Lord. The Bible uses both of those terminologies, and obviously profess is more of a negative term, confess is more of a positive term, right? But uh, what many people overlook is just the blatantly obvious about these verses, as I myself did, okay? We can easily define the word confess by its antonym, deny, right? They're opposing words. Confess, deny, they're the opposites. So either we confess, or we deny. They're the two options, right? It's not, well, there's a third option. We just don't confess and don't deny. Either we deny or we confess, right? Likewise, we can easily define then, by the same logic, we can define what John meant by confession because of how he contrasts it with its opposite, right? The opposite of if we confess is if we say that. Either we confess our sins or we say that we have no sin we say that we have not sinned. So then, because of this perfectly simple dichotomy here, we can assume that confession, in this context, it's not whether you've personally got down on your knees and confess. it's about what we admit, it's about what we acknowledge in our collective belief about our sins and how this relates to the Christ. So confessing our sins is very simple. It's the opposite of saying, if we say we have no sin and we have not sinned, that's what it means, okay? So let, let's just try to illustrate these verses that are in the present tense without adding any presuppositions or doctrinal assumptions in their day-to-day -day application, okay? So it's if we, so I'm going to illustrate this with a group of people, if we, okay, and then on any given day, because it's in the present tense, we don't need to look at past, present and future, we just look at right now at any given time, whether you're watching this today, whether you happen to be watching it the next day, or you watched it yesterday, that's not the point. On any given day, day one, day two, day three, we just apply this verse in its present tense state, okay? If we confess our sins, right? Or if we say that we have no sin. Now, in this we crowd, on any given day, what happens if any man sin, right? If we, and if any man sin, whether it's him or whether it's him or whether it's her, or whether it's him or whatever, well, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, right? If we say that we have no sin, that's what we say, well, we deceive ourselves. They're the two options. So you see how simple that is if you just take away any sort of you know, predispositions that you already had about this um, passage. So really, you, you see how quickly and, and just how simple John's statements really are. There's so much controversy about how we interpret verses 8 to 10. You know, these little verses, it, it, it's really quite simple. And, and just to clarify, if this is not already obvious, I am not suggesting that to obtain forgiveness, you need to be aware of and confess in heart and in word every single tiny micro sin that you ever do and fall in your knees and absolute tears and for, for reasons that were already given. 
earlier in the study, such as the sins of ignorance, okay? That's not the point. That's not the point that I'm getting at. The point is the mentality, the belief that you have about your sins. Just acknowledge that you still struggle with your sins in your mortal body. And just a simple acknowledgement that you are not a sinlessly perfect, self-righteous I am, okay? Because Mike Rakowski is an I am, and abide in the word is an I am, okay? And Proga Frogger is an I am. That's all I'm saying. The mentality that John is tackling here, don't be an I am, okay, about your sins. Then the point then is it's about the mentality that we have towards our sins, which fundamentally revolves around what we believe about salvation, okay? Do you acknowledge that you still sin in ignorance or, or just unintentionally? Do you, you just acknowledge it if confronted? Do you acknowledge that even the thought of foolishness is sin? If somebody confronts you about an obvious sin or a blatantly false claim that you made about the Bible, would you come up with a million and one excuses for it or just ignore the accusation and pretend you didn't hear it? Or, or would you turn on, turn it on the person confronting you and make it about them being a bad person? Or rather, would you just rather confess it and say that you were wrong? I mean, it's a lot easier that way, really, sometimes. Now, there will be certain circumstances, and there's kind of a disclaimer, that where... A brother or a sister in Christ denies certain sins and does justify oneself. And yet the opinion of another brother or sister is that he did indeed sin, right? Now, this, this doesn't undermine his salvation because actually, you know, the Bible does prepare us for, for that to happen. Because, you know, in the New Testament, there's, there's frequent places where Jesus or the apostles give instructions on how to resolve conflicts with one another and, and the church is required to to settle these issues and we're required to forgive each other right because there, there will be conflict there will be denial about certain sins even among saved brethren right because that's why the church is there to resolve these disputes because the reason why we have a dispute is because one person's claiming that a sin happened and they were wronged and another person is denying it so you know like we don't need to get too wrapped up in the legalistic thing of all our sins that we can face but it's about the mindset that we have of acknowledging our sin generally okay so wrapping up chapter one then we see how simple and comprehensible john's statements are really there are there are simply two types of people and either we end up fellowshipping with one type or we fellowship with the other type so either we say we have no sin and we have not sinned or we we confess our sins they're they're the two opposites so either we say we have not sinned, and this could apply to both sinless perfectionists and those who deny being sinners, or we just say, yes, we have sinned. Or we can say we have turned from all of our sins and we don't sin, or we can just confess that we struggle with sin. Or we can say, well, we're not trying, we, we really have turned from our sins, we're still good people. Or, on the other hand, we can say we are trying, most of us at least, but, but we still fall short of the glory of God. And uh, if, if somebody confronts us about our sins, well, either we end up in this camp where we just end up saying, la, 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 I can't hear you, you're a false accuser, or that's not really sin, God is okay with it. Or we just, on the other hand, we can say, yes, I, I was wrong, sorry about that. And consequently, either we lie and do not the truth, we walk in darkness, we deceive ourselves, or we, we have fellowship with him and we walk in the light, and he is faithful and just to forgive us and, and to cleanse us, and we have an advocate. 